Good morning and Merry Christmas and welcome to Emmanuel. We are so glad to see you and glad that you chose today to celebrate with us. If you're a guest or from out of town, we welcome you. And we have a great morning plan as folks are coming in from the lobby. Let's stand together and lift up your hearts and your voices and let's sing, Oh, Come All You Faithful. Sing this with us, Oh, Come All You Faithful, Joyful and Triumph. Oh, come.
Well, good morning and Merry Christmas. We are so glad you're here uh, today. We'd love to connect with you. We want to ask everyone, if they would, grab the connection cards found inside of their bulletin this morning. And uh, we'd love to hear a prayer request from you, how we as a church can pray for you this week. If you're visiting with us, we'd also love to know how you heard about us. And you could fill it out on that card in just a few moments. The offering plates are going to come by. You can drop those off in the plates. If you are visiting with us today, we have a gift for you as well. And on your way out at the end of today's service, you can stop by any of the Next Step tables located in the back of the room and uh, let them know you're visiting today. They're going to put a gift in your hand that includes a book that our pastor wrote. The book is called Done, What Most Religions Don't Tell You About the Bible. And in a few short pages, it takes the whole message of the Bible and makes it uh, an easy to read booklet. And so I'd love to give that to you. We'd love to give that to you today. So don't forget to stop by on your way out. At this time, though, we want to greet one another. So let's stand while the music plays. Greet someone around you.
Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. This next song we're about to sing was written by a man named Charles Wesley who actually wrote over about 6,000 hymn texts. And perhaps this is one of his greatest. It comes from Luke chapter 2. Hark the herald angels sing. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Sing this with us. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the Well, we have a wonderful Savior and a wonderful story right in front of us today, and uh, I hope that you will this week behold the wondrous mystery. I'm going to ask ushers to prepare for the offering as they do. Uh, don't forget to get your Christmas gift if you did not get one of these. It's a one-year devotional book uh, with a Christmas card and a pen and one per family. If you'd like to give these as gifts to friends, neighbors, co-workers, whatever. They're available for $20 through the bookstore. You can purchase them. We have plenty of extras, and we hope you'll use them um, and be, be a blessing to others. Uh, reminder, very quickly, we have Christmas Eve service on Tuesday night. I know, I know many of you have uh, family obligations. Don't apologize to me. I understand, okay? When we started the Christmas Eve service, it was for those who can come and uh, those who have uh, Catholic friends or whatever that are looking for a church. We want you to bring them here. Uh, we want to share the gospel. So uh, I fully understand. I don't take attendance. So I'm, not, I'm not sitting here judging you. If you've got a family obligation, enjoy your family, okay? Uh, and pray for us at the same time. Pray that God, every year people are saved at the Christmas Eve service. Every year it grows a little bit, and there's a good, a good number of guests that come. And so you pray for us, okay? Next Sunday, this is important, next Sunday we have one combined service at 10 a.m. What time is next Sunday's service? 
Okay, so the early crowd has to come a little, little later. Uh, you have to come a little earlier, uh, but we want to just fill the, and all the kids are going to be with us too. All, we're going to just have a, a, one big together service with all of our families. It'll be a great time. Uh, message is pretty much prepared as we look towards a new year and a new decade. And, uh, and I want to challenge you as we celebrate Christmas, uh, don't, don't forget that right around the corner we turn the page on a new decade. We have Vision Sunday. We have new groups coming uh, I'm just so proud of our team and all of their planning for the new year in regards to every ministry. But we counted up on Saturday morning at a meeting. We we're offering 77 different groups next year. And if, if you had told me seven years ago that our church would have that many groups offered in a year, it would have blown my mind. Um, but a wonderful group of teachers. Sunday, and we're adding an hour of groups too. So you can opt into a group at 10 a.m., 11 a.m., or Wednesday nights at 7 um, and so, anyway, it's, uh, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful year. We have a revival, winter revival coming up as well. And so we're excited about all of that. Finally, before we pray and receive our offering, I just want to, on behalf of my family, uh, as well as probably most of our staff, to say thank you to you. Uh, last Sunday, if you were here, uh, after the second service, the deacons presented a gift to Dana and to our family, to me and our family, uh, a Christmas gift from you, and we thank you. Um, and then prior to that, um, earlier in the week, we had a beautiful dinner with all of our staff, our church and school staff and their spouses. I was amazed. I think there were 50 people there at that dinner. It was I, it kind of blew my mind. Um, we had a great time together. We gave them a Christmas gift as well uh, from our church and school. And we understand that is only possible uh, because you're faithfully engaged and your generosity. That's what makes ministry possible. I work real hard to try to show you the fruit. I could never show you all of it, but uh, God's given us a really good year. Lots of people have come to Christ. Lots of people are being discipled. Uh, new churches planted. New missionaries are going. New Hope Baptist Church in Torrington is buying a building this year, and we've been a big part of that over these last six years. Um, our worship team, actually David and Amanda and Lance, are doing a concert at New Hope Baptist Church tonight in Torrington. I tried to get them, but I couldn't, so I had to, I had, I had to land on Steve Amerson, but uh, maybe they won't be booked up next year. We'll figure it out. I couldn't get casting. I could have gotten casting crowns. I could have gotten the Gettys, but I couldn't get uh, Renew Worship for some reason. They were all booked. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, so many good things are happening uh, in construction, remodeling. Uh, we've done the fel most of the fellowship hall this year. We still have some left to do. The walls are installed. Uh, the, the roof is new. It's not entirely done. There's a couple things to fix and change and then the area around the steeple. But that's uh, right around $100,000 that God provided. Not one of us in this room had to contribute to that. Insurance covered it. Uh, new roof. So it, I know that's like to you, it's like, so what? You know, but like we panic every time it rains because we're like, oh, no, you know, what's going to get destroyed? And so this part of the roof is now all new. Uh, some of you have seen the parsonage all torn up. I, I debate about whether to mention that, but let me just tell you, that's not my house. You know that, right? Right? Okay, so th we're not just remodeling because I want to. Uh, that would have happened seven years ago. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this, which is not, that's not how it is. But if you have questions about that, ha happy to answer for you. It's really the deacons saying, Pastor, this is the year we're doing the house whether you want to or not. Um, I'm just your tenant. I'm your tenant. I'm your tenant. You get that? You're my landlord. And you're fixing the water problems in my basement. That's what you're doing, okay? <laughs> so uh, actually, it'll be good. When it's done, for the first time in seven years, we will have a dry basement. And, uh, and so I just want you to be aware as you see stuff getting torn up, we don't indiscriminately do things or randomly do things or just selfishly do things. We've put that off forever trying to do other things. Uh, but we are thankful that we can do it this year because that, church, that house is an asset that the church owns, and it was uh, getting broken in some ways that really needed attention. So anyway, if you, if you have questions about that, let me know. I'll be happy to give you the long list of stuff and go over the details with you, but probably you're not concerned about that, right? Thanks for fixing the leaks in the basement. <laughs> but really, thank you for your love for us as a family and for, for your love as a staff um, and for your generosity as a church. We are praying for a Christmas offering that will just, it will just launch us into a new year. And I'm looking forward in about a week or two, I will, inter I will announce to you what God did through our Thanksgiving and Christmas offering. And you're going you're gonna to be amazed. You're going you're gonna to drop your jaw. So let's pray. 
and we'll receive the offering and hear a beautiful song. Listen to the words of the song, and then we'll turn to Psalm 145. Lord Jesus, we love you and thank you for your grace and goodness and the way you've provided and led our church forward. And you've revived us. You've restored our church and our school. And it's all you. And we give you the glory. And it is uh, to the credit of so many faithful people on whose shoulders I stand. And I'm so grateful for, for our church family. Lord, I pray you would bless them abundantly this, this season and in the new year and new decade. I pray that you would give them a restful spirit and heart. I pray that they would marvel at the wonder of your gifts this season. I pray that they would cherish the relationships of their lives and love those closest to them the way you do. I pray, God, that as we turn a page to a new year and a new decade, you would re, re, reignite our vision as a church, that you would galvanize us in unity, uh, that we would stay on mission for the gospel, be the church that you've called us to be for this time and this place, for such a time as this. Uh, so God, these next days give us rest and celebration in ways that honor you and then strengthen us into a new year and keep us on mission for you and encouraging one another. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Gave up his pride and he came in to die like a man. 
gather round the children come listen to the old old story of the power of death undone by an infant born of glory son of God son of Well, can I be sappy for four, four or five minutes? It's, um, today I want to read a tribute to my wife. Is that okay? I debated whether to do this or not. But uh, we've been married 30 years today. So 35 years ago, a girl caught my eye. We were in 10th grade together. I figured she's gonna make somebody a great wife. Might as well be me. (laughs) 33 years ago, she became my girlfriend. 30 years ago, God gave me one of his daughters, one of his best, and she became my bride. So Dana, I don't even know how to find words to fit today as we mark our 30 years together. How could we ever have imagined the story that God would write through our love story? Tenth grade seems like another lifetime ago and yesterday all at the same time. You caught my eye then and you still do. You won my heart then and you still have it. I love you now more than I ever imagined possible. And I'm more deeply grateful to you than mere words can express. I think I'm most grateful that you didn't just give up on me (laughs) in light of my failures. Every good thing that God has done in my life in the last 30 years somehow traces to or through you. You've cheered me on and helped me grow and believed in everything that God wanted to do with us together. You are superwoman, superwife, supermom, superpastor's wife, and super nana. I know you don't feel like any of these things, but in my eyes you are. I really don't know how you do it, but I'm amazed at you, and I stand in great admiration and wonder. I'm deeply grateful that God placed you in my life and put us on assignment together in this journey. 30 years have come and gone so quickly, and I have to say this year's been, I think, our best. Our trips and dates, long walks, and extra time together has been so wonderful and joyful. I have loved every bit of it, and I'm excited about this year as well. Quit crying, you're making me emotional. (laughs) Lots of times on the journey, we wondered where we were, what God was doing, and how to grow. Lots of times we were confused and perplexed and frustrated and at a loss. But with all the mountaintops and valleys today, I can say without hesitation, I have loved our life together. I loved watching you be such a blessing and source of joy to so many people around you. I have loved watching you grow from wife to mom to pastor's wife to Nana. You're a great Nana. You're so successful in so many life roles. 31 years ago tonight, we sat in a car in San Francisco, just off of Pier 39, engaged. And we listened to Steve Green sang Household of Faith. We wanted to build a household of faith. Little did we know how God's version of that dream would take shape and become much larger and more beautiful than we would have ever imagined. Thank you for forgiving me a million times, maybe two million. Thank you for having greater faith than I do on so many occasions. Thank you for challenging me to be the leader that you believed me to be and that God called me to be. Thank you for believing in God's will for our lives and that he would enable us to do what he called us to do. Thank you for taking care of me when I was sick and for so faithfully following the Lord together with me. Thank you for showing our kids what it means to follow Jesus and to love him and each other. Without Jesus and you, I am just a pathetic, hopeless human being. 
I love you. I love serving Jesus with you. I love the messy adventure that we call life. I love how you have shown me Jesus' love. Unconditional, unbreakable, unstoppable, unlosable. Thank you from the depth of my being. You are truly the best. Happy 30th anniversary. With all my love for the rest of my days. I love you. Our text today is Psalm 145. We'll see it in a moment. The theme or the idea behind today is wonder. And I think by the end of our time, you'll understand why wonder is so intricate to emotional and spiritual health and depth. Christmas puts us in proximity to wonder. Isaiah came into the presence of God and at first was absolutely alarmed and said, woe is me, I'm a man undone. And it was the touch of God purifying him and acknowledging his faith and accepting his presence and accepting Isaiah into his presence that dropped Isaiah into a place of wonder where his mind and heart were absolutely and utterly captivated. So much so that Isaiah, without even knowing what God was asking or where God was sending him, he said, please send me, I want to go, I want to be with you, I want to... I want to do life with you. I want to do uh, what you're doing. And and it was enraptured in wonder before God. And it was this prophet that said a virgin would conceive and bear a child and bring forth a son and that this child would be wonderful counselor, mighty God, and that this child uh, would bear our stripes and, and would save us from our sins. When you move into Luke chapter one, as the story continues to unfold, Zechariah is drawn into wonder as he's doing his priestly duty and he is suddenly captivated by the presence, the alarming, fearful presence of an angel of God who then proceeds to say, fear not, and begins to tell him, you're going to have a son. And he struggled to even believe it, but he left the presence of that angel speechless until John the Baptist would arrive and be born and God promised this son would be the forerunner, the heralder, the declaration, the announcer that God, the Messiah, had come to planet Earth. Some months later, Elizabeth, his wife, wondered as well that God had made her with child, an old woman who had no children. And to be without child and elderly in first century Israel, Israel was to be in reproach. It was a reproach to not have children. And she cries out to God in wonder and celebration who removed her reproach is the way she put it. Not long after, Mary wondered when she was Her life script was so dramatically disrupted by an angelic visitor who again told her to fear not that she is favored amongst women and that God has chosen her to bear the Messiah and suddenly her life script is is totally shredded. You have a young woman who's engaged uh, to a man and, and she's pure, she's a virgin, she's never been intimate with a man and now she's going to be with child and people are going to have a very hard time believing this crazy story that this is a child from God, that this is the God man in her womb and yet In spite of the bad news and the alarming situation, she declares herself to be the handmaid of God. She basically says, I'm here as your handmaid, God. I'm here in service to you. You're my creator, my author, my designer. You are my God, my Lord, my King. And so I am on mission with you. I accept my assignment. And her way of saying it was, behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. I'm surrendering all of my life, all of my story. You are so wonderful, and this story is so wonderful. And later, as she was visiting her cousin Elizabeth, she uh, says these words, my soul doth magnify the Lord. She could have been looking down at the complexity and the confusion and the perplexity of her circumstances. She could have been fretting and stewing over the loss of relationships and friendships and the slander that was sure to come her way, but she chose instead to enter into proximity to wonder. She chose instead to look up and out and to say, I magnify the Lord. I am God's. He is mine, and I'm happy that he has chosen me for this assignment. Joseph also 
preparing to put away Mary, essentially a first century divorce, though they, in our terms we would call it an engagement. It was stronger than that. And yet when she was found with child, Joseph didn't believe her story and he was planning to put her away, meaning to separate from her privately, trying to protect her at the same time, but trying to protect his own integrity. If he goes through with the wedding, if he marries her, he's essentially uh, intimating that he's the father of this baby for anyone that doesn't believe her story. So it's a little bit self-incriminating, and he's stewing and tossed and turned and not at peace over this, and God appears to him in a dream, or an angelic visitor does, and says, Joseph, fear not to take Mary to be your wife. And so the situation, situation moves from stress to wonder in Joseph's story, and he proceeds to obey God and to accept his assignment in the wonderful work and in the wonderful story that God was writing. Some months later, as Jesus was born in Bethlehem. There are shepherds out on the hills in Bethlehem, and they're just tending their sheep. And God chooses to reveal himself again through the presence of an angel, and then a multitude, as the Scripture says, of heavenly hosts crying out, peace, goodwill on earth, uh, peace towards men, goodwill, uh, I, I messed it up, good tidings of great joy was the point. And they suddenly were enraptured by wonder as, as these Poor, uh, out, out of the way shepherds, unknown. There's magi, wise men, in, in proximity to modern day Iraq. And they're tracking along with the prophecies. And they, 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 they've got record of Daniel's uh, prophecy. And they're understanding that it's about time for this king to arrive on planet earth that's been promised for hundreds of years. That, and they're God seeking, they're God worshiping, they're God fearing, they're searching for truth. And, and they see the star and they journey hundreds of miles to find this new king that's been born. And they bring gifts, gold, frankincense, myrrh, you understand, you remember the story. All of it, they're entering into the wonder of the story that God was, they recognize the wonder in a world of brokenness, they recognize the wonder and they enter into it. Why do I navigate you through this story? Well, there's two more I want to bring up. The first is Simeon. He's an old man. He's waited a long time. In fact, Israel has waited a long time for this promise. God has been silent for 400 years, and prior to that, for hundreds of years, he prophesied. He, he foretold the gospel story. He told it in terms that, that they could understand. He told it in different terms uh, than we would have understood. And in, in, in our modern 21st century context, we get the privilege to look back on it all and see all the dots connect. They saw fragments of the dots. They, but nonetheless, they, they had hope that God was going to send a Savior. He had a plan. He was coming, and the Savior was going to save them and somehow bring to fruition all the sacrificial system and all the expressions of faith and worship that, uh, that went before them. And Simeon now is waiting in the temple and God said to him, you're not gonna die until you see the fulfillment. You're gonna see this Christ, this Messiah, this Savior. And you probably know the story. It's in the end of Luke 2 as Mary and Joseph are coming to the temple as their custom was with a newborn baby and Simeon lifts up the child and he cries out, my eyes have seen your salvation. And, and this old man with probably lots of burdens and a lifetime of waiting in silence and waiting for God to show up, at the end of his life, it all comes to fruition as he sees with his eyes the Savior that he had long anticipated and believed in. There's a woman there as well. Her name is Anna. The Bible calls her a prophetess. This is not the theme of my message, but if you ever wonder if, if, if women are valuable to God and valuable in the Bible, and if they have a role and a significance to play, just read the Bible, and you're going to find over and over intricate roles and complex roles that women serve in the story of God. And here's one that God says was a prophetess. And her name was Anna, and she was 84 years old. And as a widow, at the end of her life, she just totally dedicated the rest of her life to serving God and serving in the worship of the temple. And she's waiting there, and she too recognizes and celebrates and enters into wonder as an 84-year-old woman. All of these people, and many more, experienced and received, and I'm borrowing this statement from Lou Giglio, an assignment in proximity to wonder. I, lo I love that statement, an assignment in proximity to wonder. Let me say it another way. They were wowed. They were wowed into a willing, worship-filled following of Jesus and, and an adventure with God. 
They, they were so captivated by who God is and by what God was doing that they couldn't miss it. And they were wowed into this willing abandonment of everything else. And it was the wonder of God that captivated them into saying, I don't want any other life but the life God has for me. I don't want any other ideology than the truth of God's story. I don't want to write any other story than to be a part of God's story that he's writing. This is what it means to enter into wonder. This is what it means to have an assignment in proximity to wonder. And I believe that Christmas is God's extra exclamation points on what otherwise should be a normally wowed life. I made up that word, wowed. I hope that you're, that's making sense to you. How many of you are like me? You, um, you like exclamation points. I like exclamation points. It, 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 I mean, emails and text messages, and even in writing, whenever I'm writing, I'm, I, I use exclamation points all the time. And I have these hypercritical editorial people in my life that keep telling me, they keep like, like, a, like an angry teacher, they keep grabbing a stick of rebuke and they whack my hand and they say, stop using exclamation points. Editors and, and, and literary people. And I go, but I'm happy. One, one guy I read, actually a long, uh, an, an, an older author, he said, he said, cease with all these exclamation points. It's like laughing at your own joke. That was somewhere in writing I read. Maybe someone sent it to me. But I, I got to tell you, I like exclamation points because I'm happy. <laughs> and I want people to know I'm happy about what I'm texting or what I'm emailing. It's exciting to me. And when you come to Psalm 145, it's a mountaintop of exclamation points. It is a mountaintop of celebration and praise. It is David, maybe towards the end of his life, having made a, an arduous journey in and out of caves and life-threatening situations and giant killing. I mean, you, you, you name it, David's faced a whole lot of stuff in his life. And Psalm 145 is a summary. It's David looking back over the landscape of the journey and being captivated by wonder. But it's, it's even more than that. It's David wanting others because he's documenting it. He's, he's transcribing it. He's journaling it. He's writing it in a poem and a song for future generations. In the middle of the psalm, he says, I want, I want every generation to know the wonder that I know with the God who has, who has captivated my heart. And I... I don't know if I'll get this out sufficiently today. I hope and pray that your celebration this week will, will be a celebration that enters into the true wonder of what God has done for you and who God is. And not simply the wonder of lights and gifts and, and, and the, the fun, the, the meaningful, but the trivial things of the celebration. They're breadcrumbs. They're, they're, they're arrows, they're little arrows that point you to the big giver of all of these gifts and the great work that he's done and the great gift that he offers to you. And you have a choice, not just at Christmas, but in the new year and in all of life, you have a choice. It's a, it's a choice of emotional health, to be honest with you. It's a choice of spiritual health. The choice is, will I go through life looking down Cynical, grumbling, looking horizontally at the messy, broken thing we call planet Earth and looking at the brokenness of other people and letting others just continually be a source of disappointment to me? Or will I, like David, look up, look forward? Will I, like Isaiah and Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph and the wise men and the shepherds and Simeon and Anna and so many others, will I look at what God is doing around me, before me, in me, through me, and, and what he will do to come, and will I move forward captivated by wonder? So many people have the wrong idea of God. And I got to tell you, church world and that organized religion hasn't helped much. Because God's way for you forward, the, the design of the story is that you get a glimpse of what God, who God is, and what God has done for you, and that that glimpse becomes so captivating that you don't have to follow him, you just want to. You don't have to live in his story, but you, you wouldn't imagine missing it. You don't have to embrace his will, uh, but you can't imagine being afraid of it or running from it 
because you've gotten a glimpse of how wonderful and how awesome and how marvelous and how beautiful and how much he loves you and how abundant his love is for you and his thoughts are towards you. It's, it's, it's just like being inundated in all the love your heart ever imagined having and you never want to leave that. You only want more of it. You only want to continue experiencing it. But this life, to counter, this life gives us just fragments, just bits and pieces, just one moment at a time, and it's here and gone. It's here and gone, okay? I'm not trying to be a downer. Don't take this as a downer. Just take this as a contextualizing uh, moment of teaching. We are living in, we're leaning into, we're looking forward to Christmas Day, and that's going to be this, hopefully, this, this peak moment where you know, maybe Christmas Eve, your family, your friends are gathering and gift giving and d- decorations and nice music and delicious food and treats and all of it and laughter and fun and joy. Inevitably in the middle of that, someone's going to get mad at somebody. Someone's going to have a fuss or a fight. Someone's going to be disappointed. Someone's expectation is not going to get met. That's, there's all that fragility, okay? But inevitably, here's what happens. There's a downside to it. December 26th, 27th, 28th. There's a loss of something. The wonder, the delight, it it, it happened, now it's gone. But when you understand the real depth of the Christmas story and what God's done, you're you're only one look away from re-entering the wonder again. It's, It's Christmas Day every day. And you don't have to ride that emotional roller coaster. You don't have to anchor your hope only one inch deep to things that that are just fragments, that are just, that are just appetizers, they're breadcrumbs to, that point to the greater gifts and the greater giver and the bigger heart of love. When you really let the wonder of who God is and what he's done captivate you and, and you learn the skill, that really the art of what David is doing here, it becomes a life, a quality of life that you can choose to do every moment of every day. I'm not saying I've perfected it, I, I'm learning it and I'm trying to share it with you. I'm saying you're always one look away from moving from discouragement and cynicism and disappointment to wonder. Your one turn, your one directional glance uh, back to the face of God, back to the thoughts of God, back to the identity of Jesus and to the story of redemption, back enraptured in wonder and delight and, and wanting him and wanting to follow him. This is why the psalmist pointing to Jesus saying, said, this is the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes. So four questions to answer very quickly. Number one, what is wonder? What is it? Is it, is it? is it just a fleeting thing, Christmas decorations and walking in a winter wonderland, or is there something deeper to it? I want you to write this statement down. Wonder is God's antidote for melancholy. Wonder is God's antidote for melancholy. The world and all that it offers, materially, relationally, all of it, will constantly pull your eyes down and pull your heart down into failed expectations and, and loss and disappointment. Nothing in this world can sustain you at a deep level the way Jesus will. All of it will, you get your eyes into politics, you get your eyes into uh, into the economy, you get your eyes into your own career field, whether you're coming up or coming down, wherever you are on the trajectory, all of these things are gifts from God, all of them are temporary, all of them are arrows that point to him, and if you get your eyes on those things, on the conditions of planet earth, on the, on the, uh, the things you hope to have from other people, you get your eyes on other people for any length of time, they'll disappoint you. Put your eyes on me for any length of time, I'll disappoint you. I'm just, there. it's impossible for one pastor to live up to the expectations of a congregation of even 50 people. It's impossible. So if that congregation puts their eyes on the pastor, they are setting themselves up for disappointment. But if that pastor says to the congregation, get your eyes on Jesus, you will never be disappointed in Jesus. Okay? Because he is wonderful. Full of wonder. Jesus is never someone you run from He's always someone you run to. If you ever think of Jesus as someone to run from, you've misunderstood, you don't get it. His arms are open, he has done wonderful things. So wonder is God's antidote for melancholy. And as we've studied the Psalms this season, really back till in the beginning of November, some have taught us to mourn. Some have taught us to rejoice and celebrate. Some have taught us to agonize and cry out and lament. 
But this psalm before us today teaches us to wonder. It teaches us to look at God and be amazed. Look at Psalm 145, verse one. In fact, I want you to read verses one through three with passionate conviction. Let me just ask you a question, and you may be a guest or new, and you may not have the same answer to this question that, our, that, that, that the rest of the congregation will have. Do you believe in God? Yes. 10 of you believe in God. Come on, help me out. <laughs> Do you believe in God? Okay, I I suppose you're here because you believe Jesus is God. Okay, that he came to save you, yes? Okay, and if you don't believe these things, we pray you will uh, investigate, and that's part of why I'm sharing this with you today. But listen, if you believe what you're celebrating this week is not just a fairy tale, if you believe it's actually true and that it's good and and that it's God's wonderful work, to bring you into relationship with him. I want you to read verses one through three with conviction. Not halfway mumbling and I want you to like declare it to me. Preach it to me like I'm preaching to you, okay? And make it your declaration. I will personalize it. So Christmas Eve morning, Christmas morning, the 26th, the 27th, the 28th, and every day into the new year, I will. Okay, ready, go. One through three, ready, go. I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day I will bless thee. I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. You see, here's a man broken in himself, lots of regrets in his past, lots of trials in his family. David's life is a series of mountaintops and valleys. But all the way through them, God is great. All the way through them, David says, I will bless thy name. No matter what happens in my life, I'm not gonna look down, I'm gonna look up. And even when I'm looking down, it's only gonna be a matter of time before I'm looking up, I will extol thee, my God. I will bless thy name. I will praise thy, you are great, God. And that stands regardless of my feelings. That truth is reality regardless of my emotions regardless of my melancholy. And so on my melancholy days, I have a choice. Do I stew? Do I marinate in my melancholy? It's winter, it's cold, you know, it's, things didn't go the way I wanted them to. Life has been a disappointment, people have been a disappointment, Pastor Carey's a disappointment, like whoever else, you know. And just stewing and kind of marinating in your melancholy, it just starts to stink. Or are you going to extol your God? You see, to wonder, or wonder is a feeling of surprise. The dictionary defines it as uh, surprise mingled with admiration, caused by something beautiful and unexpected and inexplicable. To wonder is to feel admiration and amazement, to really to marvel. And, And what we see in Scripture, in Psalm 40, in Psalm 72, in Isaiah 25, the words wondrous, wonderful, over and over and over. And God says, if you'll look at me, If if you'll silence your world, if you'll still the madness and the craziness, if you'll turn off the devices and turn off the television, turn off the talking heads and look up, you're going to see something that you don't normally see. You're going to see something wonderful, and it can capture your heart, and it can align your, your emotions, and it can ground you and set you stable in a world that is totally unstable. After more than 20 years of living in the high desert of California, Southern California, I gotta tell you, I had forgotten fireflies. Totally forgot about them. And so our first summer in Connecticut, quite unexpectedly, they returned to my life. Shortly after we moved here, I stood on the back deck of our home looking out into the backyard and suddenly a faint, almost imperceptible, a faint flicker transported me back decades. I mean, time warp. And I thought, I recognize that flicker. I went inside, I turned off the lights. I said, Dana, come here, quick. I don't think she'd ever seen a firefly. Had you? No. Can you imagine? Laugh it up. We, not all of us got the privilege to grow up in your pretty little Connecticut. It is remarkable though, I just, I forgot they even existed. So we step out on the deck and there's another flicker and another and 
I turned the lights off, you know, so my eyes started to adjust. And Dana's like, what, what? I said, look, just look, just sit still and look. <laughs> Suddenly I felt 10 years old again. I wanted to grab a jar and go out and catch them. How many childhood nights have I captured fireflies, put them in a jar, and drifted off to sleep with their faint flickers in my room? The night came alive all those decades later as Dana and I stood there and we delighted over God's Main Street electrical light parade in miniature. <laughs> Suddenly there were thousands. And the longer we looked, the more that showed up. Strange thing happens though, every summer, life is busy. We're rushing in and out of the house. All light, the ambient light of the deck or, or the house tend to dim our eyes. And the faint flickers tend to go unnoticed. Unadjusted, distracted eyes miss the fireflies. To see this extravagant miniature light show, you have to be intentional. You have to want to see it. You have to stop and stare. And the wonderful works of God, I would submit to you, are, are similar. We need the eyes of our understanding to be enlightened. We need our eyes to adjust. We need to pause and focus. And the longer we look at God's story and God's words to us and the message of Christ and Christmas, the brighter his reality grows, the more amazed we become with who he is and what he's done, the more we enter into wonder. And it is entering into wonder that downsizes all the negatives in life. It's being captivated by the wonder of God. Second question, very quickly, why do we need wonder? Like, why do the psalmist chronicle the wonderful works of God and declaring all thy wondrous works? Well, in David's mind, not only did he need wonder, but the next generation needs wonder. And so I have two reasons for you. The first is we need wonder because our hearts were made, were designed for eternal hope. They were designed for eternal hope. Hear me. I was talking to Brent before service started. Brent's mom went home to heaven about two years ago. And we've talked a little bit about, you know, the emotion of the seasons and of life when you've lost someone that you love. And there are others in the room. And this is a time of joy and celebration, but also there's this other part that's, that's a bit of grief mingled with it all. Maybe a lot of grief, depending on where you are with it. And I said to Brent, I said, you know what, Brent? I said, I really hate uh, a few things. I hate sin. I hate the devil. I really hate death. How many of you hate death? I hate it. You know what I hate more than all of that, though? I hate time. Time. Because you think about the chronicle, the story of your life. It, it comes and goes. So I, I liked being five. Life was simple when I was five. It's like eat my mom's banana bread. Across the street was a Polish lady named Mrs. Iring. She made the greatest angel wings ever. So I could eat mama's banana bread, eat Mrs. Iring's angel wings. It's like my life was just floating from, from home to home. It was, a, it, was a, it was a buffet, home to home, you know. <laughs> all my grandparents' neighbors and all the food they made. You know, five-year-olds, they're not worried about stuff. They're not worried about governments and, and, and it just, and I liked being five. I kind of liked being 10 too. I really... Like being, no, not 15. 15 was terrible. 16 was better. 18 was pretty good. 20 was great. I mean, I like being, how many of you remember? Yeah. In other words, every season, every week, every day of my life, there's something to, something to enjoy. I, I like being 50. <laughs> 50 was good. I, <laughs> I remember, you know, you know what I like? I like my kids when they were little. I liked them when they were newborns. and, and I liked every age. There was never a time I'm like, I can't wait till they're, or can't, I wish they were. No, it was always, wow, they're five, wow, they're eight, wow, they're, I liked them as teenagers. I had people tell me, you're going to hate them as teenagers. Love them now because you're going to hate them when they're teenagers. I'm like, I think actually you're the problem if that's your attitude. We loved our kids when they're teenagers. Now they're adults. We don't really like them so much anymore, but we like their kids. <laughs> Just kidding. We love, our, we love our adult kids and we love their kids. Kids are worth putting up with just to get to the grandkids. That's like, it's, a, it's, it's, it's like you got to cross that bridge, okay? No, you know, honestly, the, I could look back at every season of our 30 years together and even before that. I love every bit of it. 
And so we celebrate, we cherish, we, we cherish the memories. Why do, we cherish, why do we take pictures and videos ceaselessly? We're trying to preserve it. We're trying to hang on to it. And we know we can't hang on to it because it's going to go away. And so we keep the pictures that we never watch or never look at, you know. But, but it gives us this sense. We capture a picture, it gives us a sense that now I can keep this. I can hold on to it. In reality, we know we can't keep it. You know what causes all that? Time. Time. You know what eternal life is? You know why God says, you can't even begin to imagine the good things I've created for you? You're, you can't even contain it. Eternal life would be, I'm, 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 I think this, this blows my mind, but I just love to say it. Take all the best moments of your whole life. Put them into one experience that you never lose. And that's eternal life. There's no time. So it doesn't pass by. And imagine, imagine being able to enjoy your kids, your grandkids, like you enjoyed them every single day of the journey of them growing up or them being every day of celebration rolled into one. One nuclear moment that is eternal. And you can never lose it. That's eternal life. What we have here is living death. You've heard the statement where we live in the land, we think, people think we're in the land of the living going to the land of the dying, but we're really in the land of the dying going to the land of the living. What I'm trying to show you though is that the idea of living in God's economy, economy is a timeless concept. It is a deathless concept. It is a sinless concept. It is an incorrupted, uncorrupted concept. It is, it is a tightly packed intensity of joy, taking all of the joy of your life into one and experiencing forever and ever and ever in the presence of God. That's what Jesus came to earth to purchase for you and for me, and it ought to captivate us in wonder more than socks and pajamas do two days from now. And it ought to captivate us in wonder every day of our lives until we see him. That's what happened to David. But listen, the second reason we need wonder is because every generation needs that knowledge. Look at David's words in, in verse four. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak. Here's David's commitment. Here's David's passion. I want my family, friends, I want my kids, my grandkids and their kids, I want everybody I know, older and younger than me, one generation to another, celebrating the God who has won my heart. I am running out of time. I will let you read verses 6 through 13, but it is a powerful description from David's experience of who God is. He is gracious, slow to anger, great mercy, good to all, tender in mercy. His uh, works praise him. His kingdom is everlasting. David is exploding here as much as a human being can. And he's saying, I'm so glad I know this God and that he has saved me and he has stored up an everlasting kingdom for me forever and ever and ever. And those of you who have said goodbye to a loved one, you're not just gonna see your loved one again. You're going to see them as you saw them every day of your life that you knew them and forever and ever, you're going to fully enjoy and experience eternal life. And I, I don't even think my description can do it justice. I think if we could taste it for a tenth of a second, our minds and hearts would literally explode. I just don't even think it can enter in to this thing called a body. One generation blessing another. Number three question, do, where do we look for wonder? Well, the world's gonna tell you and has been telling you it's the most wonderful time of the year with the kids jingle belling and everyone telling you be of good cheer. Okay, and it's gonna be about lights and fudge and, and packages and, and all of that's good and fine. I'm not trying to scrooge that all up. It's all wonderful, okay? But like I said, it's breadcrumbs. 
There is a bigger gift and a greater giver and everything he gives you to celebrate this season and every one he gives you to celebrate this season are just arrows that should lift your heart and mind. Every gift you give should be expressed this way. This is from my God through my hands to you and it is but a breadcrumb of the great love and the great gift he wants to give to you. That ought to be the spirit of our celebration and if that is the spirit of it, it won't be trivial, it will go very very deep. So we look beyond material things and pleasurable things and food and festivities, though there's delight in all of them. And we look to, verse 14, the Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up those that be bowed down. Do you know the context there? It's not speaking of worship as much as it's speaking out you, about you being pressed down with burdens, okay? And many of you will come into Christmas Day with burdens. And what I'm showing you is you have a God who is strengthened. If you know Jesus, you're so planted in his hand, you're so in his grip. What this verse is saying is there's only so far on planet Earth that you can fall and you're in his hands. It sounds like this. It's uh, written again in uh, Psalm 37. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Do you get that? You with me? David says, the eyes of all wait upon thee. Thou givest them their meat in due season. Everybody's dependent on God, he's saying. Thou openest thine hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Look at verse 17. The Lord is righteous. He's right in all of his ways, holy, perfect in all of his works. Here it is, verse 18. This is kind of the drive home now. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him. To all that call upon him in truth, he will fulfill the desire. Listen, that, that verse does not say he will, fu he will fulfill the plan. It doesn't say he's gonna make all of your plans come true. It says he will fulfill your desires. And my experience is God knows how to fulfill my desires better than my plans would fulfill my desires. So sometimes we, we, we dumb it down, we, we, we trivialize, we go, okay, I got this plan, and the Bible says God will fulfill it if I ask him to. That's not what Scripture says. When you go to God as he is and who he is, and you say, God, I am your servant, I'm on mission for you, I accept my assignment, what that verse is teaching is that he will fulfill your desires through his plan. Now let me ask you a question. Isn't it really your desires that you're trying to fulfill? It's not the plan. It's what you hope will happen because of the plan. And what God's saying is forget your plan. I'm the fulfillment of your desires. Like give, give me the chance to show you my better way, my bigger way of fulfilling your desires. James says every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. Psalm said that Jesus ascended on high after riding into battle for us, led captivity captive, and received gifts for men. It blows my mind. Jesus went to the cross and rose out of the grave and ascended to give me gifts. That's, that was the intention, Matthew 7. He says this, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, if you, sinful, broken, selfish people, can, can be good to your own kids, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven Give good things to them that ask him. Let me say it this way. Jesus gives you a life that makes you not want anybody else's life. Jesus gives you a life that makes you not want anybody else's life. The problem is the world says, look at everybody else's life. And gives you social media streams galore to compare your life to everybody else's life. And believe me, I think there's a good and a really bad use for social media. Use it for the gospel, use it to celebrate, use it to stay connected, but if you use it to compare and be cynical and critical, all you're doing is eyes down, head down, forgetting the wonder that's Christ and forgetting the wonder of the story that he's writing through you. As long as you're wishing you could live somebody else's life, you're not living your own. As long as you're wishing you could be somebody else, you're not being who he made you to be. You're not letting him write your story. And the, the reality of it is, when you're captivated by the wonder of God's assignment for you, you stop wanting to live everybody else's life. You stop wishing you were anybody else, and you're just glad to be who you are in God's eyes. 
David said, many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order. Listen, watch this. Let me give you a little assignment in the next week that maybe you adopt into your new year. David sits down, takes out a piece of paper, and he just starts to think. And he's not thinking what Fox News or CNN tells him to think. And he's not thinking what anybody else tells him to think. He's not thinking what social media tells him to think. But he's thinking about God and, and the story and all that God's done. And, he, and, he, and it occurs to him, God, you never stop thinking of me. And because of Jesus, your thoughts for me are good. You think good towards me. And there's so many, I could never count them all. And he sits there and he just lets it soak in. How many times do we sit and soak in our disappointments or in our fall, fallen expectations? We sit and soak in how others failed us or how others criticized us or the cynicism of others. And what the psalmist give us permission to do or call us to do is sit and soak in what God has done for us. I want to read a quick story. I'll give the last two and then we'll go. I'm, I've gone too long. The winter air bit at our lungs. We walked at an energized pace through the city, New York. It was winter. Steam rose from the manhole covers, horns honked, brake lights lined the streets like long strands of Christmas decor. Focused people briskly walked towards destinations unknown. In every direction, we were surrounded by skyscrapers of every era as many cultures and ages meshed together in buildings and smells and people all around us. In one corner, a man cooked kebabs. On another, a lady sold gloves and beanies. On another, a police officer directed traffic. Shops and restaurants were filled all around us as the vapor of our breaths could be seen as we walked. Our conversation ranged from writing to Broadway to the culture and to gospel. There are a few things that I enjoy more than taking my young adult daughter to New York City. For us, it is an escape from normal into organized chaos. We love the culture shift from suburban Connecticut to the city. It distracts our minds and engages our imaginations and spurs on conversation. We most love to walk it because trains and cabs just kind of limit the experience. Walking the city, you can absorb it and immerse in it. Well, not long ago, we went to the city with tickets to a show. Arriving just in time, I presented my ticket to the security guard who proceeded to tell me that my backpack was not permitted in. This was an immediate problem and there was no place to store my computer and no time to figure it out. Reluctantly, I looked at my daughter and the other two that were with us and I said, go ahead without me. I'll hang out and do some work and catch you guys afterwards. It pained them to go in without me, but there was no time to think or feel or even work it out. So they reluctantly went in and I waited and then went and got a cup of coffee and grabbed a seat somewhere. And then my phone rang. It was Haley who would be leaving for college soon. Hey, where are you, she asked. I said, I'm sitting in the lobby about to get some coffee. With that, she rounded the corner and her face lit up and my heart melted a little. <laughs> I realized she had left the show for me. What are you doing, I asked. You came here to see the show. She said, no, I came here to spend time with you. I don't care about the show. Let's go. Well, with that, I shouldered my backpack and we ventured into the cold night air, ready for another walk in the city. Conversation meandered from school to family to boys, to college, to writing, to boys, to life in general. Though a young adult, Haley still hasn't outgrown hanging with dad, especially holding tightly to his arm when walking the city on a cold night. I'll never forget what she said that night as we paused, waiting for the crosswalk light to change. She shivered and let out a sigh and squeezed my arm and she delightedly said, oh, I just love New York City. My throat tightened, my tears warmed my eyes, and my heart melted a little more. As God said to my spirit, I knew she would. As time froze in that moment, my mind kind of warped back to 2012, when God had transitioned our family from West Coast to East Coast, large ministry to small ministry, warm weather to cold weather, thank you very much. <laughs> my fears were overwhelming in that season. And no fear was more powerful than how the transition would impact our family. Though clearly providential, the ordeal was really difficult, especially for Haley. Our lives had been upended, resulting in a lot of emotional turmoil that year, and life was kind of chaotic and frustrating and often combustible with family relationships. It's hard enough to become a teenager, much less when a 
dramatic move is thrown in. And yet there was this core durability in our hearts that, that God brought us to this place. Our identity with Jesus was intact, though it was painfully shaken. My mind hearkened forward to a dark night, long walk in the rain when I wept and said to God, I came here to obey you, but I don't want to lose or hurt my family. And he reminded me that he loved them more than I do. Then my mind fast forward to another conversation where I said to Haley, kind of in frustration, Haley, if you'll surrender to God and trust him, two years from now you won't want your old life back. God has blessings in mind for you that have yet to discover, you have yet to discover. Neither of us could see it then, but not long after she surrendered and peace returned to that junior high heart. So standing on the street corner that night six years later, I smiled at Haley when she expressed how much she loves New York City. And I patted her hand and I echoed what God said to my spirit. I said, and he knew you would. Who, she said. I smiled and said, Jesus. He knew your heart, he planned this, he brought you here and you let him. He took away your old life and gave you a new one and you would never wanna go back to your old self, would you? And she said, no, not ever, I love what God did in our lives. She couldn't see it, but the lump in my throat got even bigger and I subtly said, thank you, Lord. We, cre- we continued walking and cherishing and celebrating God's good plans. Sometimes God's plans are painful. Sometimes they're disorienting. But always guaranteed for sure, his paths always end in flourishing. It's who he is and it's what he does. It is his A game. He creates flourishing hearts, not someday, but every day, right here in this messy, broken place called earth. Right in the middle of the war, He prepares a feast of celebration. He brings cheer in the middle of the storm, not only when it's past. So the fourth question is how do we experience wonder? How do we experience wonder? Did I give you the third one? I did, okay. How do we experience it? Well, kind of like Haley. You give in, you believe, you receive. You immerse yourself in Jesus. You trust him as Savior. If you haven't, you receive him into your life. And if you have, you look up, you look outward, and you you let him do the work he wants to do in your life. Psalm 78 says, there are those who sin still in spite of all God's works. They sin still and believe not. But David said in this Psalm in verse 18, the Lord is nigh unto them that call upon him. Verse 19, he will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He will hear their cry and he will save them. How does that work for a believer? Well, it works a little bit like it did for Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the year was 1863, Civil War was raging. Longfellow had lost two wives in his lifetime, one just two years ago. She died in a fire, tragic story. He tried to save her and he was too late. His son had just left home without his dad's permission to go fight in the Civil War. You think America's in a bad time now? This was a time when Americans were slaughtering Americans on the battlefield. And Wadsworth Longfellow, he lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he's totally rock bottom in despair. He's had a prolific and a successful life of writing and poetry, but he's lost two wives and now his son, and he's just devastated. And he wakes up on Christmas morning and he hears bells, church bells, and they just make him angry. That's what happens if you keep looking down. Even God's blessings kind of torment you. And he's hearing these bells echo out, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. And he's thinking, there is no peace, there is no goodwill. Men are slaughtering each other in my own country. I've lost two wives. And he sat down and he wrote a poem. You know it as a song. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. In music sweet, the tones repeat, there's peace on earth, goodwill towards men. But I thought how as the day had come. The belfries of all Christendom had rolled along that unbroken song, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. But in despair, I bowed my head. There's no peace on earth, I said. Hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed those bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor does he sleep. For Christ is here, his spirit near, brings peace on earth, goodwill to men. When men repent and turn from sin, the prince of peace then enters in. Grace imparts within their hearts, 
His peace on earth, goodwill to men. A soul, all souls amid earth's busy strife. The word of God is light and life. Oh, hear his voice. Make him your choice. Hail, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then happy, singing on your way. Your world will change from night to day. Your heart will feel the message real of peace on earth, goodwill to men. If you've never trusted Jesus, you come into wonder by faith, not by religion, by faith. You decide to believe and receive. And if you have, I pray you will let wonder captivate you this season and for the rest of your life. Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. God, thank you that Psalm 145 calls us into a lifestyle of wonder. It is spiritual maturity. It is emotionally healthy. It is captivating, following you, celebrating what you're doing, not just at Christmas, but in the whole story. Thank you, God, for wonder. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, I would ask you, if you're a believer, to just respond to God right where you are. And if you're not, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior right now, why don't you? Why don't we invite him into your life? Jesus, to the best of my understanding, I want you to be my Savior. I want you to come into my life. I'm trusting your death and resurrection, not my goodness. I'm confessing my sin and asking your forgiveness. I want your gift of everlasting life. Now, all across the room, if you made this decision right now and you meant it, take three seconds and look up at me. I'm holding a Bible and a book. This is our gift to you to say congratulations on your decision. On your way out, go by a next step table and just tell the folks there I prayed with Pastor Kerry. They'll give you one as our gift to you. and We're really happy for you. Would you stand together quietly with me? I'm gonna ask Lance to sing one verse of a song. Before we dismiss and celebrate our Christmas, would you give God this moment of response and prayer? And would you enter into his wonder? Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. And in our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life is come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. God, I pray that we would truly behold the wondrous mystery. I pray that you'd bless this church family with a refreshing time of celebration and worship. And may every one of us find a quiet morning, maybe several where we sit before you and read and absorb your word and we let the night come alive in our hearts and minds and we are again captivated by the wonder. And take us forward, God, as a church family and let everything we do and give and say and offer in service be a result, not of our duty or our obligations, but a result of our love that has been held hostage in wonder of you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we ask this in your name. Amen. I apologize, and I'm going to not even show you the video because it is 1230. I totally lost track. Forgive me. Merry Christmas. I love you. The video will be online. Watch it later today. You're dismissed. See you in the lobby.